Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Master, who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that overcoming all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual life, understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory together with your eternal Father and your all holy, gracious, and life giving spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Our speaker this evening is Professor and Chair of the Department of Undergraduate Theology at Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology at Seton Hall University in South Orange, New Jersey. A Jewish convert to Catholicism, Dr. Jeffrey Morrow teaches a wide range of courses, including the Theology of Pope Benedict XVI, apologetics, the Eucharist, theology of the Old Testament, uh, and more. Dr. Morrow has earned both his MA and PhD in theology from the University of Dayton and specializes in the history of modern biblical interpretation. He has given more than 50 scholarly presentations before academic gatherings, published more than 100 articles, book chapters, entries and reference works, and book reviews, and is the author of a number of books, including Modern Biblical Criticism as a Tool of Statecraft, that was co-authored with Scott Hahn, Pretensions of Objectivity, and Jesus' Resurrection, a Jewish Convert Examines the Evidence. He was with us uh, previously on a talk on biblical politics, and we're uh, thrilled to have him with us again, Dr. Morrow. The show is all yours. Great. It's great to be here. So what I want to do in this first half is I'm going to talk about the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. And then in the second half, we're going to talk about his second letter to St. Timothy. So if you have your Bibles, you want to pull them out. I have my new Augustine Bible, the English Standard Version Catholic Edition that just came out. It's fantastic. Um, I'm less familiar with this than some of the others. So this, is, this has been a lot of fun for me to work through this. And what I want to do first is I want to talk about the questionable, the thorny issue of authorship, just briefly to get that out of the way. We don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, As many of you may or may not know, scholars typically only recognize seven of the letters attributed to St. Paul as actually written by St. Paul, right? So it's Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians. Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philemon, okay? With the other letters, you have varying scholars that will agree and accept the traditional view, which is that Paul wrote these. Um, So the next category of letters that you have the most um, scholarly acceptance that Paul wrote would be Colossians, Ephesians, and 2 Thessalonians. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus are the most doubted, right? With the exception of Hebrews, Hebrews is the most doubted, which we're not going to really talk about tonight. I personally think that Hebrews is Pauline. I I go with one of the more traditional views there. Perhaps St. Luke had a hand in helping him write that. Um, We don't know. But but this is, you know, these are open, these are up for debate. Uh, The pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus are the most debated. What I find personally as a scholar of scholarship interesting is that although most of the scholars who work on small portions of those texts follow the majority view in doubting Paul's authorship, those who write commentaries on the whole books have increasingly recognized Paul as author. That includes people like Luke Timothy Johnson, 
a major, major New Testament scholar. He's not a lightweight, well-respected by everybody. All right, so this is, I think this is important to understand. Why did this happen? Well, if you want to know more detail, you can read Scott Hahn in my book that just came out this month, uh, Modern Biblical Criticism as a Tool of Statecraft. We actually get into some of the historical reasons in the 19th century that led scholars primarily in Germany to doubt Paul's authorship of these letters. And to be quite honest, there's really a couple issues that they have, right? The first one is vocabulary. You're going to find a couple key phrases and words that occur, for example, in first and second Timothy that you don't really find elsewhere in St. Paul's letters. Now I'd say, you know, there's a couple reasons for that. One, he's writing to a different audience. Most of his letters are writing to a community, all right? And they're, they tend to be earlier in his missionary work. First, and especially Second Timothy, are written near the end, probably, of his missionary work. And they're written to one person, St. Timothy, right? His, his spiritual son, his disciple, his heir in, in Ephesus. The other reason, it's possible, at least, especially with Second Timothy, it's possible that St. Luke helped him in the writing of the letter. This is very common to have a secretary scribe. We know Luke was with him. And moreover, some of those, those phrases and words that are unique here are found in Luke and Acts. Okay, so we're not sure. The other reason is particularly in these epistles, you have this threefold structure of the hierarchy, bishops, deacons, priests, and so some scholars will argue that that's a later development within the early church. Okay, that would not have been a, um, an expected understanding of the community during Paul's day. Well, I think that's baloney. Okay, and you don't have to go to just the scholarship that's more recent that has kind of shown the antiquity of this notion of the overseer, the episkopos, the bishop, the presbyter, the priest, the deacon, um, this three, threefold structure. You can look to the Old Testament. Right? You can look at the Jewish context of Paul, of Jesus, the Old Testament context of the New. This structure, in a sense, mirrors what you already have in the Old Testament, where the bishop, in a sense, represents the high priest, but within his region, all right, within his church. The presbyteroi, the presbyters, the priests, would be more like the priests, the sons of Aaron, okay, in the Old Testament. And the deacons would be the Levites, or the larger crowd of Levites assisting at liturgy. Okay, so we, we could talk about a lot more than that, but I think there is, that there is a dwindling case against Paul's authorship here and an increasing acceptance of the traditional view that makes sense of Paul's authorship of these texts. Now, what I want to do is I want to go through these texts chapter by chapter. At the literal level, at the primary level, this is focusing on a specific bishop, right, St. Timothy. And it is giving him advice for how to minister in the church at Ephesus, right? So this is the problem that's going on. I want to relate it more to all of us. The problem that's going on is Paul is in Macedonia, at least for First Timothy. He's in Macedonia. And Timothy is in Ephesus, which has done pretty well. Ephesus is the church that Paul spent the most time in, over two years, not quite three. St. John was there with Mother Mary, right? So this is a church with, with major figures in early Christianity, Our Lady herself, very you know, high spiritual caliber. And yet, as time went on, problems began to, to encroach upon them. And the particular problem St. Paul is dealing with both in 1 Timothy and in second, is false teachers. Heresies are creeping in, okay? And this is a problem. And when we look at the nature of the heresies, it's difficult to tell exactly what's happening. All right, some scholars think this is like a, an early form of what later becomes known as Gnosticism, and we'll talk a little about that um, if we have time. But whatever's going on, there is false teaching here, and Timothy has to combat that false teaching. That's the problem. What I want to do, though, is as we talk about these ideas for Timothy, is I want to bring it down to a moral or tropological level and understand how we can apply this in our lives. Most of us are not bishops. I don't know if there's any bishops watching on this. Probably not. They may later. But the point is, 
this text is for all of us. If it were just for St. Timothy, it would have been left there, right, for Timothy. He would have had it. No one else would have read it, probably, or very few would have read it. We know from St. Peter's writings that, in fact, Paul's letters were read at liturgy. St. Peter himself was aware of them, and he says some of what's written is difficult to understand. So you have to be careful. So these texts were intended by the Holy Spirit, at least, to go beyond Timothy, to go beyond just the use of bishops, and to be used for all of us. And we'll see that especially in, in 2 Timothy. All right, so let's walk through some of this. All right, an overview. So what I would say is the first chapter of 1 Timothy is going to focus on the problem of false teachers. He'll return to that at the end. And he's going to use his own life, St. Paul's own life, as an example of how God's grace works. I find these letters tremendously encouraging, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But I think that's the first chapter, really. We want to understand what's going on in the first chapter. There's a problem of false teachers. Paul himself is an example of God's grace at work in the Christian life. The second chapter begins then a liturgical focus, right? A lot of controversy over, over his statements about women. I think the, con the context here is liturgy. That's the main focus. So he begins with this command to pray, especially for leaders, religious leaders, civil leaders. We need to pray for them. That he's going to get into the prayer of men. I think the context, again, I think is primarily at liturgy. Women, how you dress, don't teach. Again, I think he's talking about there's no bishops that are women. That's the point. This is about teaching in liturgy, right? If you look at Romans and 1 Corinthians, he's going to deal with some of the same issues, right? Galatians 3 is very clear, the equal dignity of men and women, right? The context here, I think, really has to do with specific teaching in the sense of, in the, sense of the church, right? That the role of the teaching is the bishop, all right? And he moves right from there in chapter 3 to discussing bishops explicitly. And then he gets into the deacons. All right? Again, he's not talking about uh, – this is, these are criteria for, you know, who do you appoint as a bishop? Who is appointed as a deacon? Right? So these are criteria. From there, we get into chapter 4. And here, the context is going to be on what's going to happen in the later times. All right, which he includes, I think, it's already including the time that he's in. So for St. Paul, this idea of the end times, the final age, has already begun. So it already applies for St. Timothy's time, I think in some sense, even more so for us. So I think that's going to be very important. He's going to contrast a false asceticism, spiritual life, with an authentic asceticism, all right? When we think about asceticism, think about spiritual athletics, athletes, the Olympics, all right? The term in Greek is the same for athlete and for the ascetic, all right? We move from there to chapter five, where he's going to focus on the role of widows, family relations, taking care of relatives, right? And then the presbyters, the priests. And finally, he's going to get back in the last chapter to talk about the problem of false teaching. And the key here, this key, I think, to the whole thing, which is a problem today as well, is that problem, that vice of the love of money, which we'll return to, the love of money, all right? And he's going to give the contrast of what Timothy, and therefore all of us, right, what we need to strive after. So let's get into some of the, the weeds here. Let's get into chapter one, right, early on. He addresses St. Timothy as his true child in the faith. This is chapter 1, verse 2. So he already sees this father-son relationship with St. Timothy. Paul is the apostle of Jesus Christ by command of God, okay? And Timothy is, in a sense, his successor in Ephesus. And he is exhorting him, remain there. Charge, this is verse 3, charge certain persons not to teach any other doctrine, any different teaching, any different doctrine. So that gives us a little clue into the problem that's going on. There are teachers going around in Ephesus. Maybe they, they knew Paul when he was there. Maybe they heard his preaching. But they're teaching something different 
than the Jesus Christ Paul preached. All right, there's false teaching. What are the specifics here? This is what he says. He says, this is verse five. The aim of our charge is love. Love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's our charge. What does that contrast with? What these people are teaching, they're engaging in vain discussions. These are, not, these are not controversies that are there to build people up. They tear people down, right? Now, when you look at the specifics about the myths or whatever, right, he's probably talking about some of the controversies surrounding Old Testament texts, all right? So when you look at modern scholars, one of the other reasons they'll doubt Paul's authorship is what they'll say is, well, there's a number of different texts during this time, especially in the Jewish world, where they said, well, this is written by Baruch, right, third Baruch, or this is written by Enoch, first Enoch, second Enoch. Obviously, this is not written by Enoch or Baruch. They're long dead. Well, that's true. And they'll argue that Paul is doing the same thing. One of the differences is, is that the Jewish texts, this is called the pseudepigrapha, the false writings. They are, when they're attributed to somebody falsely, they're not attributed to a contemporary like Paul. They're attributed to an ancient figure from far earlier in the Old Testament. And, and what would happen in Jesus' day and in Paul's day is there would be these kind of elaborate theological discussions about these kind of vain mythical texts focusing on a certain part of the Old Testament. Paul is saying, stay away from that. That's not, that's not really our concern. Our concern is to build people up in love. Our concern is for the truth. What truth? Well, Jesus Christ, right? And it doesn't mean that we can't engage in legitimate discussions, but whatever they're talking about is leading them into vain controversies over mythology. That's not what we're talking about. That's not our point, all right? They're talking about the law, but they don't understand it. And, and so what? So he goes through from, chap, from verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8, you know, basically through verse 11. We have a list of sins, of commandments in the moral law, that you can find in the Old Testament. There are clearly issues then. There are issues now. They haven't gone away. Liars, well, we lie now. Okay? One of the things he's trying to do is explain that the law is good. Those sections of the moral law, they're still in force, right? The Torah, the law is there to teach us to be just, merciful, faithful, right? So it's possible there are teachers saying that these things really no longer hold for us. In fact, Paul tells us to be free. We have freedom in Christ. We can do whatever. We hear that throughout church history. A lot of times you will hear people tout Paul. St. Paul is their, their, their source, guided by the Holy Spirit, inspired by God. He tells us we're free, therefore we can sin, and sin boldly. All right? I'm not going to tell you who I'm quoting there. Um, right? Martin Luther, right? Table Talks with Melanchthon. What we see, that's probably a problem already here. St. Peter alludes to it. Some of what Paul writes is difficult to understand. St. Paul is alluding to it here, perhaps. We don't know. But this, this is a problem here. So what is Jesus doing? Jesus is here to save us from sin, right? It's a wonderful line. Actually, I was just watching the, the series The Chosen, if anybody's seen it. It's really wonderful. This TV show about Jesus. And in there, they have this line with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is asking him, are you saving us from the Roman Empire? He says, no. No, I'm here to save you from sin. And Nicodemus says, from sin, that, that's it? You're not here to save us from Rome? He says, no, I'm here to save you from sin. Well, that's what St. Paul is trying to emphasize here. Right? I mean, this is really quite eloquent. Let's, I'm going to read this. This is verse 15. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. I right, know we, we read this and we say, "Say, Paul, you don't know what you're talking about." I could give you, I could give you a run for your money. You, you're the, see, you're the foremost. And yet, when we look at the lives of the saints, this is not that odd of an expression. I'm the worst of sinners, and we think, "Well, that can't be possible." Mother Teresa, really? <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> have you heard my confessions? Right? No. But there's a, there's a truth here that I think we don't understand. And I think uh, Bishop Robert Barron writes about this really well in a book he wrote a long time ago called Walking the Christian Path, something like that. I think it's called The Walking the Christian Path. And it's quite beautiful. He says that as we draw closer to Christ, the light, we are able to see better the little ways that we offend God. For those who are closer to Christ, it's not that they never sin. Rather, they are more aware of their sins. That's the point. Right? It's not that St. Paul is committing murder. He did. But it's not that he's doing that now. Right? It's not that he's committing adultery. Right? Probably not. It's the little things. And he is more aware of them. Why? Because he's close to God. Right? He was always very holy. Even in his persecuting of Christians, he was what? He tells us out of ignorance. It was out of ignorance. He thought he was worshiping God, right? As to the law, he was righteous, a Pharisee. The Pharisees get a bad rap. You know, exteriorly, they were probably pretty good. They were guys, you'd want to be friends with them, right? They're not going to cheat you, this, that, or the other. They're going to be praying all the time. Maybe you don't want to be friends with them. I don't know. But what Jesus is criticizing often in the New Testament is the interior and that's the problem that's the problem for all of us we get stuck in the exterior father i did that father i didn't do that maybe but it's the interior that's the root that's where all of those things come from they're far worse right whatever you're doing flows from the corrupt heart that's that that's what has to get rooted out and that's what saint paul is so clearly aware of this is what he says verse 16 I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. That goes for all of us. Paul is a great example. I mean, that's why I took him as my confirmation name. I myself a convert from a Jewish background. Right, Paul, right, convert from Judaism, right? He, he's an example of God's mercy, w- which we're all in need of, as Pope Francis continually reminds us. So he's an example for us, okay? And what's the encouragement? Verse 18, wage the good warfare later. Fight the good fight. What is he saying? Go out and buy a gun? That's not what he's focusing on. It's a spiritual battle. He's focusing on the warfare against the devil, the world, and the self. Okay, we're, we're fighting against ourselves. All right, that's, that's really what's going on here. I think that's important for us to recognize. Paul, as apostle, is not just a model for Timothy. Paul, as grace-filled, redeemed sinner, always in the Savior, is a model for me and for you and for all of us. Then we get to the second chapter, and boy, is this important. I urge, verse 1, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. All right, I mean, in a few lines, he's going to go down and say, verse 5, there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And how many times do you hear Protestants or others say, you can't ask a a, a saint to pray for you? There's only one intercessor, one mediator, Jesus. And we say, amen. Therefore, we ask the saints to pray for us. All right? Because Jesus is the one mediator between God and man, we can intercede and must on behalf of each other. So you pray for me, I pray for you. We ask the saints to pray for us. He just asked in the beginning of this chapter to have intercession and mediation made on behalf of all. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our one mediator, and we are in Christ. We are connected, one body. The saints in heaven are not less able to make intercession on our behalf. They're more able. I can pray for you. Let's be honest. I'm, I'm grading my papers for final exams. I've got, we had our seventh baby that was born last month. 
You know, I got a house full of, of kids. We got, I had a lot of things going on. I had my own sins. But when I'm in heaven, I'll have nothing to do but pray and praise the Lord. So the saints are our great intercessors. And this is what he says for the saints on earth, us. Supplicate, pray, intercede, offer thanksgiving. For who? All people, everyone. But then he goes further and specifies, especially, right? Kings, right? rulers, all who are in high positions. Think of our governors, right? The president, the presidents and prime ministers of other nations, dictators, whomever, bishops, the pope, right? All of those in high positions. Okay, so this is important for all of us. Why? Because God desires all people to be saved. Right, so those who are in authority have a special task to guide and govern both civil leaders and ecclesiastical leaders. They need our prayers. Right, this is the context of men pray without anger and quarreling. Right, you can think of mass. I don't want to point fingers anywhere, but I remember being in, in masses sometimes where you have the intercession, right, the prayer of the faithful, and they open it up to the faithful, and you have these like political wars go on. Pray that so-and-so is not elected. Pray that so-and-so is elected. Pray that it's one person trying to, you know, defeat the other. And, I, and you know, wow, you know, wow. You know, right? Don't quarrel. Prayer is not about that. Pray for others. Good. But let's not quarrel. It's not quarrelsome. Right? Women, about modesty. Again, this is a context here. I think the context, obviously, we all have to be modest. But the specific context here, I think, is going to be about, right, liturgy and in the church. Right, don't teach or exercise authority. Obviously, he's not talking about in all contexts, because in his other letters, right, he does allow for teaching and for fellowship and those sorts of things. But right after this, he mentions the bishop. So I think the connection here, he's talking about church authority, right? Priesthood, episcopacy, that's the focus here. Okay. Chapter three and four, I'm not going to dwell on this because of time, but these are these are great lines about bishops, deacons. First of all, being, managing, being able to manage their own household. Right? If they can't manage their own household, how can they manage right, the, the affairs of the church? Okay, so, so all the context here in this context, for those who are married in these contexts, are focusing on the qualities. Right? St. Timothy, he's going to tell Timothy this elsewhere. Don't be hasty in ordaining people, in laying on hands. Right? Investigate them. Right? You, you don't want to, you know, this is, not a, this is not a light decision in this sacramental office, okay? Ultimately, it's God's work. Ultimately, it's a work of grace. But there's effort involved, right? So there's decisions have to be made, right? And then, and then this key line in verse, verse 14, I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how you, one ought to be, behave, this is verse 15 now, in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and buttress of the truth, right? The church is the pillar and buttress or foundation of truth. And often you'll hear, right, Protestants will talk about the invisible church, and that is a reality. There is an invisible church. And St. Paul is just talking about the invisible church, and he can't be, because the point of this is that when there's controversy, we know where to go. It has to be, there has to be a visible structure. Moreover, he just finished telling us about the visible structure. Bishops, deacons, all right? So the structure here is important. Is there an invisible bond in the church? Yes. But there's also a visible structure, right? It's both and, it's not either or. So when we turn to chapter four, we see the real problem now that Paul has to address. And he's asking Timothy to do it for him. This is what he says, chapter 4, verse 1. In later times, which includes where they are now, I think, this is debatable, but I think it's already including St. Timothy's time, and obviously it includes our own. And we can walk through church history and see how this has played out. Some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. Right, so this is not just superstition, this is not just a lack of faith. He's talking about spiritual beings, demons. Through the insincerity of liars 
whose consciences are seared. This is frightening stuff. And now here's two issues that are connected that I think he's getting at. And we see where Gnosticism plays into this. Later heresies like Gnosticism or what St. Augustine had to deal with, Manichaeism, or what St. Thomas Aquinas had to deal with, the Albigensians, also known as the Cathars in the 13th century. We have problems like this now. Pope Francis has identified what he calls a kind of a new Gnosticism. They, they forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving. It's about physical things, right? So marriage is bad. Why? Because sex is bad. Natural production of children is bad, right? Food is bad for the Albert, I'm sorry, for the, um, for the Manichaeans, right? Meat was bad, right? And so in fact, the Manichaeans, when St. Augustine was talking about sin, the Manichaeans really believed that if you ate meat from an animal, you were ingesting sin. It was a, a particle you could ingest, like a virus, right? And what St. Paul is saying is no. St. Augustine said no. Right, I'm sorry, St. St. Augustine said, no, sin is not a thing. It's not a substance. It's the lack of the good. It's the lack of love, right? It's a privation. It's a lack. It's an absence. And what Paul is saying is a little different. Marriage, right? Marriage is a vocation. They'll talk about that, right? He talked about that earlier, actually, in the end of the uh, chapter two, when he, when he talks about um, women saved, mothers saved through childbearing, and people go, ah, oh, you know, what does that mean? Is this anti-woman? No, he's talking about childbearing as sanctification, that, that actually it is, it is a holy thing, right? We, we can sometimes read this and say, you know, punishment. We don't really understand biblical punishment. Those, those terms are therapeutic, right? They're not, they're not punishment, suffering, all sorts of things that we, we really in our modern context don't understand. We think of what we do as humans, right? But the reality is what God is talking about with childbearing, with suffering, with ordinary life, is that all of these things can become something holy. They're set apart for God. They're divine. I, I really personally think, I want to do a commentary on this at some point, the book of Leviticus is the great answer to all this. If you really understand the book of Leviticus, you understand what God is doing is he wants to be a part of all aspects of our life. And so what he's saying here is, is motherhood is something holy, right? Childbearing can make you Holy, you can become a saint by being a mother. You don't have to go off to a convent. There weren't convents back then. So in a sense, what he's doing here right, is he's challenging those to say, yo, you're a mother, you're a sinner. You're a father, you're definitely a sinner. Shame, 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 right? You can't control yourself. And what he's saying is no, 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 no. You still need to control yourself. Being a father, being a mother, you can become a saint through that. We see this in Ephesians. We'll see this, I think, in 2 Timothy. We can talk more about this later. And he goes further here, right? The point is what? It's about an authentic asceticism. It's not being a tough guy. It's not the heretic Pelagius saving ourselves. It's what? Bodily training for God, right? Chapter 4, verse 7 and following. Train yourself for godliness. Well, bodily training is of some value. You know, exercise, godliness, godliness, holiness is a value in every way, right? And then we have to kind of wrap this part up. So he and then encourages him to be a preacher of the word. You know, this is for Timothy, public reading of scripture. Don't neglect this, right? And it focuses on the fact that he is a successor to the apostles as a bishop. He's received ordination by the laying on of hands, okay? Then we have this whole conversation about widows, providing for the family. This is kind of inner church politics, if you will. There's a category of widows. Well, who is an authentic widow? Who, right, needs the church to take care of them? And who has a family that can take care of them? Right? So that's kind of exhortation here, all right? Let me jump further because we have to end. He returns to the false teachers in chapter 6, having an unhealthy craving for controversy. It's not about finding truth. That's important. It's not about building up in love. That's important. It's about quarreling, arguing. It's about being argumentative, right? Because why? Because you love controversy. You love to be, to win the argument, you're right? And this is the key here and for all of this, really, is the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It's not having money. It's not being rich. It's loving it. It's the desire, right? If you have rich, what does he say? If you're rich, 
right? Pursue righteousness, be generous, give. And what happens, you see this everywhere. You start to see, you start to see that the love of money, right? Pushes us to turn God out and pursue vice and other things in, in its place. Money and the things of this earth are meant to point us to God. So we should be able to give them up freely for God, right? When they hold us down, we give up the creator for the created goods. So flee these things, verse 11, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, etc. Okay? And he tells us what we should do, right? Avoid irreverent babble, verse 20. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. We, too, must guard the faith for our families, okay? So now we're at 2 Timothy, and it really kind of continues very well with what was in 1 Timothy, even though it was written later. We don't know for sure when it was written. There's a lot of debates about within Paul's missionary life. Um, I, I think it's probably written near the end of his life, but he's in prison in Rome, approaching death, which is, um, we kinda, he gives some hints to that, you'll see in the, uh, in the letter. Um, so he's probably writing from Rome, no longer in Macedonia. And Timothy is still in Ephesus. He's still trying to reform the church there. And it's a struggle. Right? He's young. People are doubting his, his ability. And so what Paul is really doing here, I think, is a, is a great work of encouragement and exhortation to help him, encourage him to fight the good fight, reform the church, suffer for your church. A lot of suffering here. He's calling him to his vocation as we too need to be recalled and recommitted to our own. So if I would give a quick little overview of this. I think um, chapter one, really, I would, the way I read this is it's about vocation and suffering, right? Chapter two, you have a focus on apostolic succession, this key kind of hymn or whatever about baptism, although he doesn't call it that. It's, I think it's implied. We'll talk about that when we get there if we have time. And the struggle for holiness. That's a struggle. It takes effort. Then chapter 3, we return to this theme that we already saw at the beginning and end of, of 1 Timothy about false teaching in the last days. And connected to this is the doctrine of the inspiration of sacred scripture. Right? There's a famous line from 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God, which the Second Vatican Council quotes and you hear all over the place right, across, across Christianity. Right, and then he ends in chapter four with the exhortation to preach, a, a little comment about his own sacrifices, and uh, and final greetings, which I, I also find the final greetings very encouragement. Hopefully, I'll have a few minutes to talk about that and why the mention of Mark and then Prisca and Aquila. But let's talk about let's get into the, the weeds here. All right, Paul again to his beloved child. Right, Paul sees Saint Timothy as a son. But you often hear this, don't call anybody father. Well, yeah, Jesus meant to not accrue titles for yourself. Paul himself sees himself as a father to Timothy, and Timothy as a spiritual son, right? It's fine if my son Patrick or Robert or John or Nicholas or my daughter Maya Eva or Anna Therese who can't speak yet calls me dad. There's nothing wrong with that. I am their dad, right? That's, that's the point. All right? It's about not looking after titles for yourself, right? It's about humility. So what is Paul doing here? He's, he's underscoring the importance that Timothy as bishop guards the deposit that was entrusted to him, the deposit of faith, okay? What faith? The faith of Jesus, right? Going beyond that, the faith, he says in verse 5, that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, right? So, so Timothy comes from a, a Jewish background, right, from his mother's side, where they're, they're converts to Christianity. First, his grandmother. And so he's not the first Christian within his family, his grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice. So his mother's also a Christian. And now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, and this part, I think this is so important. And this, I think, relates to all of us. It doesn't really matter what our state in life is. But for this reason, I remind you, he says, to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 
but what's going on here? This is about vocation, right? He's going to come back to this. Um, and this is verse verses six through seven. He's going to come back to this in verse nine, where he says, "Who saved us and called us vocation, called us to a holy calling." All right, this relates to Ephesians one four, right before the foundation of the world. God called you to be holy and blameless. Right? We talk about vocations now. We, we kind of have a very fuzzy way of talking about them, which can lead to all kinds of problems. I have a vocation to this. I have a vocation as a theologian. Okay, sure, right. But but vocation traditionally in the church, and this is what kind of this is where Vatican II became kind of like wow, vocation to holiness. What you know? Um, prior to that, when you think about vocation, that term is typically used in canonical legal contexts within the church, right? You're talking about religious vocation, right? Priestly vocation or the holy orders, marriage vocation, yes, right? And so that calling dealt with canon law, where you have a witness for marriage, in the context of marriage, right? Where you have the church calling the future um, candidates to be ordained, or religious life, Right? It's, it's, it's a multiple thing here. I mean, I tell my students this. It can be very hard when they're turned away from religious life or the seminary and they really want it. And yet they're told no. And it's heartbreaking. Like getting, you know, wanting to be engaged and she tells you no. Right? It's very difficult. And, but it is. It's like that. Right? I might say, we're called to be married. And she might say, no. Well, then the answer is no. And so it's very difficult but these sorts of vocations are, are not just what I feel and think. They involve the church. They involve another. And yet, what the Second Vatican Council is doing with that language is it's applying it as a calling from God for everybody to the perfection of love, of charity. It's a universal call to holiness. We are all called to the perfection of charity. So vocations, religious life, diaconate, priesthood, episcopacy, marriage, our vocations to holiness. But even if, even if you're not called to marriage, even if you're not called to be a deacon, a priest, a bishop, or join a religious order, you're still called to become a saint. But I think that's the point. So although on the one hand, at a primary literal level, Paul is talking about Timothy's vocation to be a bishop. At another level, I think this can apply to all of us. Fan into flame. Why? You have to fan it into flame. Every day. Every day. Whether you're single and you're talking about your love of God, which is important for all of us. Whether you're married and you're talking about spouse. Whether you're a Jesuit and you're talking about the Jesuit order or another order, a priest, deacon, bishop. You have to grow in love and zeal for your vocation. Now, my vocation is a very specific name, Maria, right? My wife, right? Our vocations are going to be specific, right? Father Hezekiah has both the priesthood and a spouse. But either way, it's going to be a concrete, specific calling. But we have to fan it into flame. Why? Ordination, marriage, vows in a religious order, baptism, which we all share in common, is insufficient, right? Is insufficient. You can be, what I mean by that is this. Baptism, just because you're baptized doesn't mean you're not going to go to hell. Doesn't mean that maybe you'll go to heaven, but you're not going to go to purgatory. He doesn't mean that. Being ordained a priest doesn't mean you're not going to go to hell. Ordained a bishop. It's not, not enough. We have to correspond with the grace of God. It's God's grace. We have to correspond to that grace. And St. Paul's going to talk about that here with St. Timothy. The call is to become a saint. We can't just relax. Well, I'm married. Right? I'm married. I can't fall in love with somebody else. I'm married. I'm going to be completely faithful to my wife with no effort. I'm, I'm a priest. No problems. I'm never going to leave the priesthood. I'm never going to be unfaithful. I will do my prayer and, and every day my prayer will just be more incredible than the day before, I hope. But that is not without effort, right? It might be. If it is, it's the grace of God. So we have to correspond to that grace. St. Paul, as a seasoned apostle, again, this is near the end of his life. He's run the race. 
He did it. He's going to have his head chopped off in Rome. He's going to be beheaded in Rome. He's in prison. He knows he made it. But he also knows that he had to fight. He had he even says elsewhere, I beat my body. Why? Right? Lest I should lose what I fought so hard to attain. But I checked my teaching with the apostles. This is it's incredible in Galatians. In Galatians, he says, right, I went to Cephas and to the elders in Jerusalem. Why? Right, lest I be running the race in vain, lest I be preaching another gospel. What was amazing about that is Jesus Christ himself appeared to St. Paul and gave him a message. And yet Paul went to check with Peter first to make sure he was on the right track. He tested the spirits. Uh, it's very important. One of the lessons here of humility, Paul has humility. He's, a, you know, he's got virtue. And he's trying to encourage Timothy to the same. Fan, fan into flame the gift of God. Why? If you're baptized, right, this is one of the importance of Godparents. This is one of the importances of the, pro, of the promises we make as parents when our children are being baptized. We have to provide, we have an obligation to provide a home that will be conducive to our children becoming saints. We, we get the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, as well as others in baptism. They are a gift we receive. As infants, for those of you who were baptized as infants, and myself in my early 20s, I think I was 21, maybe I was 20, I can't remember, 20 and a half, something like that, an Easter vigil of 1999, that tells you how old I am. But we have to correspond with that grace. We have to grow in those virtues. How do we do that for the baptized? Those of you not married, not priests, not religious, not deacons, but baptized, how do we do that? Well, especially confession, right? Some, many of us can't get to confession right now because they're not available. Contrition, right? We need contrition. And we need, with God's grace, to try to make that as perfect as possible. Not to be legalistic. But why? Because we want to love God. But one of my, my sons, who is not old enough yet to uh, go to confession, I won't tell you who, which one this is, but it's really beautiful to me. He was talking to me today. We are talking about his relationship with God. And he can't go to confession. He's too young. He says to me, he says, Dad, when I, when I disobey God... Or you, you know, I sometimes tell God I'm sorry. I said, that's wonderful. That's beautiful. That's great. He says, because I can't go to confession yet like you do. But I tell God I'm sorry. I said, that's wonderful. Keep doing that. That's great. And even when you are able to go to confession, when you're aware of your sin, don't wait for confession. Tell God you're sorry and then go to confession. That's a beautiful thing. And And we were talking about contrition. And he said about, you know, sorrow and why. And I said, well, the most important thing is not worrying about heaven, hell, purgatory, you know. The important, the important thing is it's about love. It's really about love, right? I don't want to, you know, I can, I can give my wife, you know, I can tell her I love her. I can get her flowers and chocolate, but what, to make her happy. I want to, I want to make her happy. I love her. I want her to know I love her by my actions. And it's the same with God. We should want to show God with our actions and sorrow that we love him. That's what it's about. And maybe we're not there, but that's where we need to move. If we don't, right, we can, we can lose what we have. We can grow lukewarm. So confession, Eucharist, again, I don't know about you, I can't receive the Eucharist right now. Spiritual communions, right? So in this time when we are bereft of the Eucharist, those of us who are, which is many of us, we can express the desire. The Council of Trent, right, in its doctrine on this, follows St. Thomas Aquinas and says that if you aren't able to receive the Eucharist for whatever reason, but you, you desire that, you express that desire, you receive the grace of the sacrament without the sacrament. That's the Council of Trent. That's, that's the doctrine of the Catholic Church. Of the Catholic Church. This is an pr- appropriate time, I think, for us to remember that. So the Eucharist, important. When you can't, spiritual communion, prayer, okay? We have to live acts of charity, we have to grow in our baptismal graces, right, through the means God has given us. Well, it's the same if we're married. It's the same if we're part of a religious order. It's the same if we're a deacon, priest, or bishop. We have the same means, the sacraments, prayer, the saints, Our Lady, right? We have to fan that into flame. So we have to work every day to fall more in love with our vocation, a love that expresses itself in deeds. It's not about feelings, all right? Feelings are good, they're fine, but it's not about that. It's about deeds. It's about a conscious choice and a decision 
to love God and put God first. That's what he's saying here. All right. Going down further. Verse eight, share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Suffering is a great gift. I was just in a social media debate that I should not have. Is this a vain controversy? I hope not. And somebody was talking about, you know, if you're a real Christian, you don't suffer. And I said, wow, we, we interpret scripture very differently. No, no, Jesus suffered. We too have to suffer, right? We will be heirs with him, Romans tells us, St. Paul tells us, provided we suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. Christians are not exempt from suffering. The beauty of the teaching here is we can sanctify suffering. Sin can separate us from God. Suffering does not. Rather, suffering can become a means of drawing closer to God. Sin cannot be a means of drawing closer to God, except when repented, right? Through humility and through the mercy received by God through repentance. Right? So, 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 so when I commit a sin, that doesn't draw me closer to God. When I go to confession, that draws me closer to God. Does that make sense? It's very important. Suffering too. The suffering for God, for the kingdom of God, for the gospel, can be a beautiful thing, as difficult as it is, as ugly as it might seem when you're persecuted for the faith in various ways. This can be a holy thing, all right? Why? Because of God's own purpose and grace. That's the key to this. It's God's providence. In his infinite providence, God allows us to go through these trials and he draws good from them. And it really is an amazing thing. I mean, we have so many stories in Scripture. I think of the Joseph narratives. But so many stories where God takes somebody, somebody else's evil, somebody else's sin, and works good through that. Right? We can commit a sin, and God says, I don't, I don't want you to do that. You shouldn't have done that. And then he says, but that's not an obstacle to me. In the end, I work all to the good for those who call on my name. Okay, so he keeps going on. It's the importance of suffering. Um, this is why St. Paul says in verse 12, this is what I suffer as I do. Right? Paul's been beaten with rods. Right? He, he had the 39 lashes with the whip that Jesus had, not once, not twice, but on five separate occasions. Okay? He was shipwrecked. He was stoned, left for dead, imprisoned many times, and now he's waiting for what will lead to death, all right? And this is where we get into the kind of the baptism in chapter two and effort that this takes, all grounded for him in, in the apostolic succession, all right? This is what he says. He encourages Timothy in verse two of chapter two. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust of faithful men. Now, what has he heard from him? Paul's an apostle, so he's heard the apostolic preacher, okay? This is apostolic tradition at its best. Timothy gets both the oral tradition of the apostles from the mouth of the apostles, Paul, and the written tradition, scripture, like first and second Timothy. So he is a, a primary recipient of apostolic tradition. It's kind of impressive, right? It's wonderful. But then he goes on to apostolic succession as Timothy is a successor to St. Paul, so he too will have successors to entrust this divine deposit to. Okay? And then he compares this work to that of a soldier in verse 4, an athlete in verse 5, and a hard-working farmer in verse 6. Right? Soldiers who fight battles, athletes who train themselves, and a hardworking farmer who really plows the field, works the land, plants the seeds, reaps the harvest. That's the call of a bishop. At some level, that's all of our callings. Right? Bishops have a fundamental responsibility to do this. They are the teachers of their faith. Right? So, so our, our bishop, the ordinary here, he is the primary teacher, the one responsible for the teaching in his diocese. I teach at his seminary. Right? But I am not the one fundamentally responsible for that. I have freedom, and so I'm responsibility. I'm responsible for my actions. I have to be responsible before God that I am, I am teaching authentically, right? But the bishop is ultimately responsible for that. 
I'm responsible too for my children, okay, as their father. So we all have various responsibilities to teach the faith. I really love what Pope Francis wrote in um, his apostolic, I believe it was his apostolic exhortation, um, uh, Evangelii Gaudium, by the joy of the gospel. That's which one it was, definitely. When he talks about the importance of the universal call to evangelize, right? He takes, he kind of plays on this idea of the universal call to holiness in Vatican II through baptism, and he grounds his discussion there, and he says, as St. Paul says, we too have a universal call to evangelize. You can't just say, well, that's for priests and missionaries. No, if you're baptized, Pope Francis says, you are a missionary. And then he says two things. He says, on the one hand, that should inspire us to seek good formation so we can become a good missionary. But on the other hand, he says, don't wait for good formation. Share the faith you have now, right? Share what God has done in your life now. And I think that's a way we can apply what St. Paul is saying to Timothy, right? For us, we have to fight the good fight as good soldiers. We have to spiritually train ourselves as a good athlete. We have to plow the field, do the work of of an evangelist, a missionary, as a hardworking farmer, all right? And then he goes down and says, you know, he talks about himself, Paul, being imprisoned. Ah, verse 9, but the word of God is not bound. And we see this eloquently in his letters. I love it. In the end of Philippians, when he's imprisoned in Rome, he says, the saints in Rome greet you, especially those in Caesar's household. Here's Paul alone in prison. And he's converting the prison guards. He's converting the members of Caesar's household. It's amazing, right? The devil wanted Peter and Paul to go to Rome to be killed. And what happens? (laughs) They convert the Romans, and then the Roman Empire gets converted. It's it's wonderful. It's the crucifixion all over again, right? That won for us, right? Oh, happy fault, the sin of Adam, that won for us so great a redeemer. Oh, happy death, Good Friday, that won for us so great a salvation. Well, it's the same thing here. Oh, happy martyrdom right? Because the blood of the martyrs is the seas of the church. And this is where he gets into this kind of verses 11 through 13, this beautiful little hymn. I think it's about baptism. Actually, I think it's really about baptism, uh, the Christian life and death. This is what he says. If we, if we have died with Christ, we also will live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful, right? This death and life, right? Elsewhere, uh, for example, in Romans six twenty two through 4, this is about baptism. Right? This is about Christian baptism. At some level, it's about the Christian struggle. It's about all of our lives. And obviously death. When we die, right, we rise with Christ. And he moves from here, again, to the same sorts of, of admonition he gave and warning in the last letter to Timothy, about avoiding quarreling over mere words, irreverent babble, okay? And this is where the Christian struggle begins, his discussion. Uh, it reminds me a lot of chapters, really, three or four of Ephesians, also James. But when you walk through chapter 2, verse 21, actually 20 and following is very important here. He says, we have a, we have a few minutes, so I'm going to keep going. He says in verse 20, now in a great house, a large house, a palace, There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, right? Some for honorable use, food. Some for dishonorable. Use your imagination. You can watch kind of medieval films. You can figure that out, right? Chamber pots, things like that. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use. Set apart as holy. Useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work, right? Uh, I'm not going to use kind of the language Luther might use here or or Paul elsewhere. Um, But, you know, cleanse it. Clean out the the chamber pot, right? Cleanse it so that you would be willing to eat from it, right? And if you do, if it's that clean, it can be used for honorable use. And he's using it as a metaphor for the Christian life. We have to strive to love God. When we do, right, when we do, we can be used by God. And a, and a note here, this doesn't mean, you know, oh, you committed a sin, you got angry, you, you got angry, 
you know, wrongfully at a child, you thought they had done something and you were wrong. You falsely accused them. That's it. God can't use me. No, God can still use you. How? Right. You have to turn away from that. So the point here, and you know, he goes on with correction in a minute here. We have to give corrections and we have to receive corrections. We need to give them, as he says here, in gentleness in verse 25, but we have to receive them in thanksgiving, right? Correction is really important. It's very difficult to do, right? But it's very important. We have to recognize the ways in which the Holy Spirit is constantly correcting us. But I think we have this wrong vision of God. I think we look at God as a hunter, right? Waiting for you, you know, why did you take this person? Why did you let them die right now? It's so tragic, and it is, often, always. Or, you know, I can, you know, you commit a sin, and God's the hunter waiting to pick you off. No, that's, I don't think that's the biblical image of God, not as I read Scripture, certainly not as I read Scripture in light of the tradition. Right? God is more like the gardener, right? waiting to take the rose right in its perfect state. Right? It's perfect. This is its perfection. You'll see that in heaven. And it's the same with us. It's not that God is there, you know, waiting for us to make a misstep. You sinned again, you know, go to hell. No, God doesn't desire the destruction of the wicked, but our conversion, it's begin again, right? One of my favorite lines from the Christian spiritual tradition is this, that the Christian life consists in this, to begin and to begin again, right? That's, that's the point here. It's that continual cleansing of the pot, the chamber pot, the continual cleansing, right? The continual turning back to God. Lord, I'll do better next time. But if you don't give me your grace, it'll be much worse. I need more grace. That's the idea. He goes further. So he says to St. Timothy and to all of us, flee youthful passions, but instead pursue righteousness. You have the same contrast going on in chapters three and four of Ephesians right? Don't steal in Ephesians, but rather work and then use what you get from your work, from your honest labor to give to others in need. There's a contrast going on. Same thing here, right? Flee youthful passions and do what? Pursue righteousness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish Ignorant controversies. Gosh, I'm probably guilty of that. They breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. What, but be kind to everyone. Be able to teach. Patiently enduring evil. Boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> correcting opponents with gentleness. Right? I mean, we spouses correct each other all the time. This happens all the time. Maybe not always the right way, charitably, the right time. I think of, uh, I have uh, friends in religious life, there's these Franciscans, and they talk about, you know, all of them consistently say it is more difficult to give a fraternal correction, a correct yeah, a brother, than to receive one. I think in married life, sometimes it's easier to dish it out, right, um, than to take it. But we should strive to be the opposite. We really should strive. I see something, you know, there's certain things, you know, we have pet peeves. They're not a matter that offends God, right? They're just a pet peeve. Let it go. Learn to love that in the spouse, right? They put the toilet paper on the wrong way. Classic example. Learn to love it. But there are some things, you know, if I forget to do the dishes, and, it's, you know, I'm supposed to do the dishes or take the trash out, I think tonight's recycling, if I forget to take the recycling out, my wife can't just let that go. I need to know that, right? That That's... That's order to the smooth running of my household. I need a correction. I probably shouldn't need a correction. I should know. But I might need a correction there. So how do we do that? We have to find the right time to do it. Do it in private, not in front of the kids. And in the right way, not you always forget, you know, to take the recycling out, right? But in a, in a loving way, hey, you know, you, you know, you forgot to take the recycling out. I did it on my morning run right before they came. You know, maybe next time you could, you know, write it in your schedule or set a reminder. You know, I can remind you if you want. Just something charitable. Maybe, you know, it can be, you, you can lighten the tone a bit. Corrections sometimes have to be made, but they should be done with gentleness, right? They should be done with gentleness, even to one's opponents, let alone one's spouse. 
right? This has nothing to do with my wife. My wife is very gentle in corrections. This, my point is um, I might not be, and you might not be. And so we have, to, we have to grow in this. And then he goes to what? St. Paul goes to chapter three, where he returns to the same discussion he had in 1 Timothy. But there's an added oomph here, an added uh, emphasis, right? Understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will love, be lovers of self. I don't know anybody like that. Certainly not me. I think I, think I brought that up in my last confession, actually. Right? And it's true, right? Um, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless. We could just go on. Slanderous, right? Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. So he says to avoid such people. But in general, I, I think it's important to recognize this is not just that time. This is our own time, right? This is not just the last days and some future time. It's now, all right? Again, bear one another with gentleness, right? Be able to teach the others. Let's jump to verse, well, 12 is encouraging. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, right? Just expect it with a smile, okay, with a smile. Going down further, he's going to talk about Scripture. Let's do this. Let's, let's go to verse 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Some translations will say inspired by God or God breathed. The ESV, CE says breathed out by God. It's the same concept. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All right? So Scripture can be used for all of those things. So this is what the inspiration of Scripture is about. And then in verse 17, we see why. Why did God inspire Scripture? Which, by the way, right, if you follow Thomas Aquinas, this, what this means is, is that God not only inspired the Scripture right, to keep it free of error, to teach us the truth, right, but also they're the words of God written in human language. So it means that God, what's written here, he wanted written here. Right, so it's not simply, well, I'm going to make sure he doesn't make a mistake. It's more that what he wrote, I wanted written. Okay, that's important. And it's more than that. It also means that the inspired author was moved to write scripture because God moved them to write. Right, so the inspiration covers all of that. Okay. But then it says the most important part here, I think, is verse 17. So that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work scripture is inspired so that we could live out every good work so that we could become saints that's the point we have scripture we have god's love letters to us the bible which is not just family history it's autobiography we have his in a sense prayerful text for us his communication to us so that we could correspond to his grace and become saints. That's the point. Like St. Paul. Like St. Timothy. Then he goes on, uh, chapter 4, preach the word. This is, again, following Pope Francis, this goes for us too. Be ready in season and out of season. All right? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience in teaching. Why? For the time is coming, I would add, and now is, when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Okay? This is important. So we need, to, we need to know doctrine, the church's doctrine. We need to know scripture for our own relationship with God, but in part so we can help those who are confused Right? People are confused now, and they always will be. Even when our, our current context is over, people will still be confused right? by trials they experience, by challenges they have, by whatever. And we as Catholics are entrusted with the church's scripture and tradition to help bring clarity and light, to help bring hope and faith and love to those contexts. Right? So we, as we wrap up, 
I just want to mention that Paul uses sacrificial language to talk about his impending martyrdom being poured out as a drink offering in verse eight, verse six, excuse me. Okay. And then the last thing I will mention is, which gives me, gives me great comfort is the mention of Mark in verse 11 and then Prisca and Aquila in verse 19. Why Mark get Mark and bring him. He is very useful for me in, in ministry. Why? Because they had a falling out. Mark abandoned uh, Paul earlier, right? And Mark went with Peter. Now they've reconciled. Right? These Christians had a falling out. These are saints. Saint Mark, Saint Paul. They had a falling out as saints, and they came back together again, right? We must not write people off. We must always be open to reconciliation, right? If we've hurt somebody, if we've defamed them or they've hurt us, we need to try to reconcile with them. And then Prisca and Aquila, why? Also known as Priscilla and Aquila. Why? Because... They are his, this married couple that were never ordained, never part of a religious order, and yet they were co-workers with Paul throughout his ministry, preaching the word of God as tent makers in their ordinary life, right? And so I, I kind of, re- I feel like I relate to that. So I, I love those guys, right? That married couple. All right, so we'll end there. I'm sure there's a little bit of time for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Morrow. Yeah, we will we'll transition to Q&A right now. Taylor Letwin uh, is asking about, First Timothy chapter three, verse 11. This is on the uh, qualifications of deacons. And it's reading, the women likewise must be serious, no slanderers, but temperate, faithful in all things. And he's wondering, um, you know, is this the basis for the argument of women in the diaconate? And, um, you know, how, how is this supposed to be interpreted in the, in the verses surrounding it? Excellent question. Um, in, in my in my opinion, and the scholarship that I've read on this, I say, first of all, that is part of, that's not the only thing, but that is part of the contemporary debate that you hear about female deacons. Um, I would say a couple of things. I'd say, one, I think what's going on, it's, it's either the wives of deacons, which sometimes is used for deaconess, right, the, the feminine term in Greek, or, right, it is a deacon, but not in the ordination that we're talking about, right? So, so there's a lot of deacons, people call deacons, which just means servants, right, in Greek, that aren't, they're not, they don't have the hands laid on them. They're not, they might do various catechetical functions, but they're not those who become priests, become bishops, etc. cetera. Uh, even in a permanent context, they're not necessarily recipients of holy orders. So not everyone called a diakonos or deacon, right, is a recipient of the sacrament of holy orders. As time went on in the church, that term becomes exclusively used primarily, at least in the West, for those who are the recipient of the holy orders of diaconate. Right, which is not the case by this time period, right? Because again, it's Greek, so they're talking about servants. Some servants are ordained servants, and some are not. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? But there were women. There were clearly women who went about cate- catechetical work, and he, you know, even Paul talks about them in other letters about women preachers and prophets and things like that. Um, but they were they weren't those who were ordained. Our Lady was never ordained. The holiest woman in the Catholic tradition, no tradition for being ordained, celebrating Mass, baptizing anybody, etc. Although women can baptize, right, in extraordinary circumstances, they may not be the ordinary ministers. I'm not an ordinary minister. And yet under, in case of necessity, anybody can baptize, male or female, Christian or non-Christian, mm-hmm. in the case of emergency, for example. Okay, very cool. First uh, Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. This is this uh, section, let all who are under the yoke of slavery regard their masters as worthy of all honor, right. so on and so forth. This person's writing, how, how are slaves incorporated into the early church? And this person is, uh, you know, it's often heard like this is an endorsement of slavery. How do we respond to a claim like that? Yeah, so it, it's tricky. So I think um, Philemon, the, the letter that he writes to a slave master, um, that's an excellent example where he's telling him to love him like a brother, right? He's, he's exhorting I me. Mean, I think you can see an implicit critique of slavery there. You know, he can't critique. This is not a system that's a Christian context in a Christian culture. This is the Roman Empire. Roman Empire is not Christian. You don't have the abolition of slavery here because they're not in a position to be able to do that, for, for one. So you have this thing, this unjust system in place. You know, what do you do with that? Right. And so I think he's recognizing the fact that being a slave is not an obstacle to becoming a saint, nor to converting the master. Right. And so I think that's part of the context here. He's focusing on the salvation of the slave. And the conversion of the taskmaster. Now, what if the taskmaster who owns the slave is Christian, right? Again, you can help each other out. And then the, um, um, and I think in Philemon, you have this implicit critique. He's your brother. He's your brother in Christ. Treat him 
he, St. Paul says, as you would treat me, right? So it's not what we would like, but he's not in a position to overturn the Roman Empire in their practices either. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Norma, please feel free to unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Morrow, I need to know, well, um, these are letters from Paul to Timothy. Are there any letters from Timothy to Paul? No. Nope, not that we know of. Although we know Paul wrote other letters that have been lost. But no, we don't have any, any evidence of Timothy's letters to Paul. Uh, Mary, what was it? Mary Martha was wondering, you had referenced uh, the Council of Trent as to um, supporting this, the, the, the idea that the act of the spiritual communion. Um, do you know maybe like uh, the section in which that's located in or under us? A... It's either chapter eight of the 13th session or chapter 13 of the eighth session. I think it's the 13th session. And they dealt with the Eucharist in general and said there's three ways. They followed Aquinas right out of the Summa Theologiae where he talks about the three ways of receiving the sacrament. The sacrament itself, right, spiritually or both spiritually and sacramentally. An atheist, a pagan, anybody can receive the sacrament. It doesn't do any good to them. That's just the sacrament. You can receive it spiritually and get the benefit through desire. Ideally, we would receive it both by the sacrament and by desire. So Trent takes Thomas Aquinas' teaching and makes it dogma. Basically, it becomes the doctrine of the church, the official teaching of the church. And then many saints talk about that after that, right? Like John Vianney, there's Catherine of Siena. There you go. Okay, so that, there's your reference, Mary Martha. There's right. another question coming in here on Second Timothy chapter uh, 2, verse 25, which is on um, correcting others, right? This person's writing it and is wondering, should we correct those who aren't Catholic or who have different morals than us? And if so, how do we go about doing this? This is not talking about that. I'm not saying no. I think you can. For example, I have a, a colleague who's a co I have a friend, not in not in theology, <laughs> at, at a business school somewhere in the world. There's a, um, a professor that was, I guess, committing adultery, not Christian, mm -hmm. and the Catholic approached him. You need to stop this. This is going to ruin your your family life. And the guy basically cut off his friendship. And a year later, said, you know, you're right. It was a mistake. I've changed. You know, I think there's a place for that. It's not what St. Paul is talking about, I don't think, primarily. The idea of fraternal correction is correcting a brother, right, to kind of help them along in their process of sanctification. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, we can, we can help correct others as well in the work of evangelization. If we see somebody doing something that's going to hurt them, we want to help them. That's basically, I think correction is not about, I'm right, you're wrong. It's, I want to help you. It really has to be other-focused. And sometimes that means we have to bite our tongue and not say anything because it's not going to help at that moment. It's really about helping the other not proving that we're right. I think that's really important. But yeah, we can help non-Christians, right? But we have to do it with gentleness. We really have to be like a good parent. I, I am not, but we have to be like a good parent who goes <laughs> to different children. They need different things. And so my friends need different things. And as we get to know them, we love them. And as we love them, we understand them. And when we understand them, we know why they did that and the other. Now we know how to help them, right? Because somebody might do something, use contraception, you know, lie, cheat on a test, whatever, for a whole host of reasons. You know, somebody might not, not, they might not do their homework. Why? They're lazy. Maybe it's not lazy. Maybe they're angry. Maybe they don't have fortitude. It's just too difficult. If you don't know why they're doing it, you don't know how to correct it to help them. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you, Dr. Mara. That kind of wraps us up for Q&A here. Uh, we really appreciate you spending time with us and leading us through First and Second Timothy. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.